Amen. Good morning, New Life. How are you? It is great to see you. Man, that grooving music, I was like getting into that. That was all right. Thank you, Mr. Soundman. Um, it is great to have you with us today and uh, here at Main Campus, and greetings to our North Campus viewers as well. They're uh, meeting right now up in DePoeville, and it's just great to see what God is doing through this church and through you as the body of Christ, that you have a card, right? You're a card holder to the kingdom. And that is a wonderful privilege. I just get excited to see what God is doing. And I just tex texted Pastor Kirk this morning to say, it is a great day to be alive. I want you to tell your neighbor, it is a great day to be alive. Come on. He is down in Herkimer, New York at New Life Family Church, Pastor David Hainer's church, preaching this morning. He gets on a plane and flies out to L.A. where he's helping Angeles Temple Church and L.A. Dream Center start to formulate their model of kingdom business to impact the city of Los Angeles, California. That is exciting. And our youth pastor, Joseph, is right now in Michigan speaking this morning as well. So it's just neat to be in, involved in kingdom life. I'm telling you, there is no life like it. There is no better thing to live for than the person of Jesus Christ. And he is far from a thing. He is the man, Christ Jesus. And what an honor to serve him. So it's just great to have you here again. Uh, if it's your first time, I hope you have a good time. Um, and Miss Christopher. I am the associate pastor here as well. So we're going to get into the word of God today. Uh, before we do, though, I need to say a big thank you. And if you could help me applaud all the incredible volunteers that came out yesterday for our church-wide work day. They were awesome. And we got so much accomplished, and it's just like spring cleaning in the house. You ever have that? Just, it's just, it's just purging and just getting rid of, I don't, I don't know what I just threw out, but it looks better, right? It's just good. So we had a great time, and a big thanks to all those volunteers. So in that spirit, uh, I get to kick off, and I'm really excited to kick off our new World Changers series. That launches today, and this is exciting, and the first message was wonderful. With the Lord's help, I hope the second one will be too, and if you could just give me a little uh-huh as we go, all right? Talk back. You can talk back a little bit. Say amen if you're feeling it, all right? If you don't say anything at all, I take that as you're not feeling it, so it's okay, but just uh-huh, just a little in there, okay? Try it with me. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Oh, it's going to be a good morning. So um, I, I want to kick off this morning by discussing a story about King David. And if you can kind of put your finger in second, uh, yeah, we're going to put your finger in Second Samuel verse uh, chapter 24. And we're going to get there in just a moment. But to kick this off, this story is really a story that sets the context for where we need to go today, specifically addressing the heart and specifically addressing the fact that our behavior as people influences the culture around us, both positively and negatively. And I want to look at something that in, in a negative aspect had a detrimental effect to the culture because of David's representation of the kingdom or misrepresentation and how he was able to renegotiate that into a place where it blessed the people that he was called to cover and steward and serve. And how I believe that's a model for where we need to head as world changers. And if we get this right, we have a major impact. Ladies and gentlemen, if we get this right, we have the chance to revolutionize our church. If we get this right, we have a chance to revolutionize our families. If we get this right, we get to, a chance to impact our community and serve them in such a way that they will never forget. And it's not that they forget who new life might be. We just don't want them to forget who Jesus is. And if we can bring him to remembrance, then we've had a mission accomplished category put over our life. Come on. All right, and that's my hope. I hope that's your hope too. So this story to set it up in second... Samuel, thanks, bro. Come on, I'm feeling front row. You're on fire today. What? All right. To set this story up is we have David, who is the king of Israel at the time, and he ends up taking a census of the people. Now, you might not think of a census as the bad thing, but in David's day, it was a bad thing when it was done the wrong way, to the point where David sinned before God. And as a result, David, God's wrath fell on the nation of Israel because of David's mismanagement of authority. You might say, well, how is a census bad? Like, I knew the dude slept with another guy's wife and then killed him on the front line of battle. This is a census. That doesn't even compare. Except that the byproduct of David's misrepresentation of his authority ended up costing the lives of 70,000 people in three days. A plague had come upon the nation of Israel. Now, why is this happening? What, what's the context for it? 
And to start, you don't need to, to turn here, but you can read it with me. You can take a note on it if you'd like to. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, God says to Moses this, when you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. The meaning here is this, is that when David took the census of Israel, what he was saying is, Israel belongs to me. He missed the understanding that God was the only one who was allowed to authorize a census. Why? Because nation of Israel belonged to God. And David stepped into a place where he misrepresented his position. And instead of saying, Lord, I'm obedient to you because you're the ultimate king, he operated as if he were the ultimate king and took a census on his own accord, in effect saying, Israel belongs to me. I have a right to count you. A man in his day only had the right to count or consider that which belonged to himself. And so in doing so, he usurped God's pre present position and said, I, in, a, in, a, in effect, am God of this scenario. And as a result, a plague came upon Israel. Everybody say, bad deal. It's a bad day for your David, man. If you're David, that is a bad day. That is a day you're not enjoying being the king. It is a violation to consider the value of life without offering something to the owner of that life. If I were to have you look at somebody across the aisle from you today or in a different row, go ahead, just look at somebody, some beautiful person. Say, hello. Come on. Now, in that life is represented the life force of God. Whether they know Jesus or not as their Lord and Savior is irrelevant at the moment. The reality is, is that they are actually made in the image of God. And when we look at them, we're recognizing God's handiwork. Again, irregardless of whether they believe it or not, we're seeing God's likeness. That's because they belong to the Lord. You do not belong to me. My wife does not belong to me. My children do not belong to me. They first belong to God. And as a result, I have a responsibility to steward them. And so it's in this context and in this heartbeat that we see David now start to understand, wow, I've made a mistake I messed this up. These people do not belong to me. I stepped into a position that was not mine to fill, to fulfill. And as a result, people are suffering because of my behavior. Could I, could I be, just be honest with you and say that I believe some of the things that we're seeing our nation suffering from are because of Christians abdicating the responsibility to serve our nation? Well, it got real quiet in here. Come on. We are called to serve our nation. In fact, when we can throw stones and point, point fingers at, at, at Washington, at Hollywood, at Nashville, whoever you want to, but the reality is those things only happen in the absence of Christian men and women of God representing kingdom values in the earth. And so what I see is not a stone throwing or a finger pointing. I see the opportunity to say, wait, wait, we got this wrong somewhere. We got to correct it. That's what D David is doing here. He's saying, I've done something wrong. It's invoked a plague on my people, and now I must correct it. I must find something to change my world. And here's where we pick the story up. 2 Samuel chapter 24, starting at verse 17, if you're with me. And it says, when David saw the angel... He said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. But these people are as innocent as sheep. What have they done? Let your anger fall against me and my family. Do you understand that the problem that we face in our lives is never with other people, is it? It's not really other people. It's us. It's our perspective. These people are innocent, David said. The issue is me. The issue is me as your representation on the earth. There's something at, at work in me that is contrary to what you want to have at work in me, and we need to correct it. And, and he's getting it right, because David is finally getting the message that he was called to lay his life down for others and not to take advantage of them. Ladies and gentlemen, you live in 21st century America. America. Ye, even the poorest of our poor live in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. We have been given much, and to whom much is given, much is required. 2 Samuel 24, verse 18 says, That day 
God came to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. So David went up to do what the Lord had commanded him, always a good thing. When Arana saw the king and his men coming toward him, he came and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Why have you come, my lord the king, Arana asked. David replied, I have come to buy your threshing floor and to build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. Take it, my lord the king, and use it as you wish, Arana said to David. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and, and you can use the threshing boards and oak yokes, ox yokes to make wood to build a, a fire on the altar, and I'll give it all to you, he says in verse 23. Your majesty, and, and may the Lord your God accept your sacrifice. Man, I'm telling you, this is a good deal if you're David. This is your lucky day. This is called favor. Everybody say favor. Tell your neighbor, favor. This is a good day. You walk in, you're like, man, I have messed it up, and, and I, I have just gotten a spanking from the Holy Ghost, right? And I need to make this right. And suddenly, I mean, if this is me, I'm walking, I'm like, this is great. Woo! I got the means, I got the method, and I'm getting it for free. Come on, I walked into Ch Chipotle this week. It was a great day. It was 1 o'clock after the rush on, like, Wednesday afternoon. And I walk in, and there's just, like, eight guys behind the counter. They all at one time, like, welcome to Chipotle. I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. Yeah, you're talking to me. What's up? I got my phone out. I'm like, you're the best staff ever. I put it on Instagram. I'm like, Why? I love promoting Watertown. I love promoting what God's doing here. Even in the secular world, I love to see righteous things coming out of people that don't even know God yet. Come on. That gets exciting to me. And so I walk up. I get my three tacos and the hot sauce. I like it hot. And I'm just get at the end. And I'm like, hey, Christopher, it's on the house. This Christopher? Yeah, it's on us. Sweet. I'm like, this is great. This dude has like tats all over in Psalm 3 over here. I'm like, you love Jesus. This is great. Favor. I'm eating favor. It was great. It's a great day. Can, can you imagine? Did you hear the national story this week about the three college students that bought a couch at the Salvation Army down in New Pulse, New York? Come on, the national headlines. They find 40 grand in it, 40 large in the couch. What would you do? Woo! Favor! I got 40 grand! Come on! No, don't be all holy on me. What would you do? 40 grand! Um, I justify that real easy. Food for my babies. Don't tell me that's wrong. Come on! And college. Woo! 40. Come on! stashed inside the couch they bought from the Salvation Army store. So what did they do? After a lot of deliberation, they said, a lot of moral discussion, because of a note they found with a woman's name on it, they went back to Salvation Army, ended up finding the phone number, called her, and they returned every cent. Shoot, man, that's good stuff, man. It turned out that the money was socked away out of the, woman, the woman's late husband's concerns that he wouldn't always be there for his wife. She has chosen to remain anonymous. It represented decades of savings, including wages from the woman's job as a florist. For years, she also slept on the couch, but recent back problems led her daughter and son-in-law to replace it with a bed, meaning that the couch had to go. This was her life savings, and she actually said something really beautiful to us, said one of the students. This is my husband looking down on me, and this was supposed to happen. But you see, that actually reflects something really powerful. Because while David could have said to Arana, thank you, blessings, you're going to come have dinner at the palace. In fact, any time you want to come over, it's on me, it's on the house. Look at what he says. Verse 24. But the king replied to Arana, No, I insist on buying it, for I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord my God that have cost me nothing. 
I will not give that to the Lord that costs me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the Lord answered his prayer for the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. You understand that David was able to move in such a way that he brought healing to his nation even though he was the one that caused it. Why? Because David just wasn't giving generously. David was giving wisely. And there is a difference between giving generously and giving wisely. Why was he wise? Because he was not only trying to make up for and atone for his personal moral failure before God, but if you remember back in Exodus where it said that a man had to give a ransom for the census being taken. He had to recognize monetarily the owner of his life. David was literally making an atonement, a ransom for the people that he had misused in acting like he was God. God. And it says the plague was stopped. How many would like to see plagues in our nation stopped? We might not deal with locusts. We might not deal with rivers flowing with blood like you think of in the Ten Commandments and in Exodus. But I believe there are very real plagues culturally in the fiber of our nation. How many would like to see those curbed? Because the people of God started to get their act together and say, I will not give you, God, that which costs me nothing. That's what we're up against. That's what's on the line. Amen. A couple claps. Yeah, it's good. I love it. It means you're getting it. If one person gets it, it was worth it. Let's keep moving. So we, we look at three different ways of giving, three acts of giving that change the world, three acts of laying our life down. The first one, and I, and I believe one of the most noble, is this idea of giving with wisdom. Now, what does that mean? Giving with wisdom means that we place God's heart at the center of our offering, acknowledging that he owns it all. Placing God's heart at the center of our offering, acknowledging that he is the one that owns it all. Now, listen, I, I'm excited. Here's where we kick off this series. Because this summer, over the next 12 weeks, you are going to hear from some of the most powerful ministries that we could get here. I am pumped for who is about to take this stage this summer. There are some pr surprises that even we're shocked about. And, and I'm, I'm excited, again, to see what, what transpires in the house. One of them is Guitars for Glory. If you don't know about Guitars for Glory, you can Google them later. They are an amazing ministry that are giving guitars to worship leaders around the world, some of whom have never owned and never will own an instrument until this happened. That's exciting. They're going to be on our stage with their worship team ministering the word of God to us. We're going to have Exodus Road here. If you don't know anything about sex trafficking other than it hurts people, that's enough. I hate things that hurt people. But when you talk about a ministry that's strategically rescuing people and ministering to broken lives, that is something worth investing in. When you talk about in ministries and who they are and what they do in Guatemala and we've partnered with them to see them literally transform the village and city of San Cristobal and see God do something amazing in that nation, something that defies logic, they're going to be on this stage. And so we have a question which is, will we give wisely to who they are? But we can't do that unless we understand that they don't belong to us and none of what we have belongs to us. We give wisely when we begin to see, God, you're in the center of this. And I'm merely a steward. I'm merely a manager. I'm merely someone that you call upon to help, but I bow out of the scene when you show up. If we're giving on behalf of people that belong to God, we cannot give to the Lord that which costs us nothing. The second manner of giving that changes the world is, a, is what, I just don't know how else to say it, giving by faith. There are certain acts of giving in wisdom that include a supernatural element of giving. Something that moves into the unlikely, the, the, the unintellectual almost. See, there's a difference between giving when it hurts and giving when it doesn't make sense. Have you ever given something when it hurt you to give it? Anybody? A couple hands. Anybody else? It hurt you to give it. You're like, man, I don't want to give this to you, but I really need to. I remember giving a guitar away once. I'm like, what am I doing? 
but my spirit was going, yes, my flesh is going, no, right? If you ever have wrestle between your flesh and your spirit, by the way, if there's ever like two figures or two acts of kindness that you're contemplating, one is lesser than the other, here's the way I kill that spirit. I just add the figures together and give that, and the enemy never lies again about a false figure. Come on. I just believe that we are going to be in a season where we're going to be challenged to give supernaturally as well. Some of you already walk in that daily. I have people in my life that are supernatural givers. I don't even know how they make ends meet. They're just, they're constantly giving. Can I tell you, that's a lifestyle of Christ. Jesus will never ever be repaid in full for that which he gave away. When I leave the planet, I want it to have been said of me and my wife that we gave more than we ever took in. Let that be our testimony. Why? Because it was Jesus' testimony. And last I checked, I want to be like him. Yeah, that was good. Oh, I love that. Thank you. The third one is this, that we need to give from obedience. Give from obedience. Now, this one, this was the elephant in the room, all right? And this, is, this is where it gets real awkward and quiet, but there are some of you, a small group of you in here today, that are still being challenged with what God's word says about being obedient in tithing and offering, now, can I just say to you real quick, parents that have raised children, I want to tell you that my parents raised me teaching me how to give my tithes and offerings. It's the first check that my wife and I write every month. And I'm blessed because I never had to overcome the intellectual difficulties by, with that a lot of people encounter who haven't been raised this way. So parents, continue to raise your kids in the kingdom. They'll bless you for it when they're my age. Come on. That's to honor you. Raise your children in the kingdom. They'll bless you when they're my age. I never had to, to well, I don't know if I should tithe this week. That was like, are you stupid, Christopher? Of course you're tithing this week. It's the first tech you always write. And I praise and honor my parents for raising that, me that way. And then our offering is what we give above and beyond that. Our offering is what we say, and fortunately for us, the Lord has, has enabled us to do this, where our offering has always been bigger than our tithe. It's where we just go, this is our heart now. That's, that's our duty, but this is our heart. Here, who do we want to bless this week? Who do we want to pour into? And the Lord is looking for people that he can pour money through their fingers. That's what he's looking for. That's called being a good steward. Bad stewards hoard. Good stewards let it flow. Come on, that should be our new slogan. Just let it flow. Look at your, look at your spouse. Say, let it flow, babe. Like your husband say, let it flow. Come on. And it just got real awkward. <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> the only way to beat the spirit of mammon is to give your way out of it. For those of you that are still struggling with the issue of tithes and offerings, which is fundamental Bible, it's fundamental obeying the Lord. The only way to really beat that spirit of mammon, which is what it's called, is to give your way out of it. You could ask for prayer, you could get counseling, you could read every Dave Ramsey course you want to, but until you give your way out of it, you will not be free. I hate to be that guy, but I'm that guy, just telling you the way it is. So how do we turn the world upside down? Let's turn to Acts chapter 17 as we, as we close. Acts chapter 17 is a great moment in the New Testament church where Paul is situated in Greece and specifically in the city of Thessalonica and he's getting his preach on, man. He is just like, hey, Thessalonica, this is the good news. And he's talking about Jesus the Messiah, the once and coming king who came, who died, raised himself up from the dead and then empowered his church with the Holy Ghost. And as a result, we have some very religious people who have a particular reaction. And I want to pick up the story in Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 5. It says, but the Jews were jealous. You can underline that word. Be careful of being jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set in the city, uh, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd, to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city authorities, shouting, check it out now, these men who have turned the world upside down 
have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. In the New Living Translation, it says, they are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, New Life, can I just tell you today that the reason I don't have any issue talking about this stuff is because my allegiance is not to a political party. My allegiance is not to a nation or a flag. My allegiance is not to a president or a government system. My allegiance is not to my bank account or my check. My allegiance is not to the vehicle that I drive or the clothes that I wear. Come on. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He dominates my life. As a result, it allows me a unique perspective. While all those things are important and I need to make sure I'm faithful in my tithes and offerings uh, in the church world, I need to make sure that I I have my car operating properly. My kids are counting on me, bringing home food, very real. But can I just tell you that all of this stuff is secondary to my pursuit of the king and his kingdom. That means when I view you, I do not see you as my possession. I do not see you necessarily even as my church, even though we're family. What I see are people that belong to God. And therefore, I cannot offer you something that doesn't cost me something. Even today, in the manner in which I preach, I cannot preach to you unless it costs me something. I want to go home at the end of today tired and burnt from just expending all of my energy for you. Christopher, how can you be so animated? How can you not? Because we're called to give one another something that costs us. Something that hurts to give. That is the Christian life. And that, I believe, is what the Lord is calling us as a family to this summer to be world changers. If you got that, say, "Uh uh-huh. Come on, if you really got it, say, "Uh uh-huh. Like you got something on the inside that just needs to come out, and the only way to get it out is not with articulated words, just, "Uh uh-huh. That's where that comes from. So how do we turn the world upside down? I'm going to give you four ideas, and then let you run with it, and we're done. Four ideas on how we turn the world upside down this summer. And like David, recognizing that he had issues before the Lord, we must ask ourselves, what are we doing on behalf of the people that we're standing in the gap for? That's where these four ideas come, motivated from. And I I like these. These are fun. First of all, show up. Just show up this summer. Summer is often a time that we think we decelerate. We just kick back. But can I tell you, in the, in the kingdom life, summer is not a time to decelerate. Summer is a time to engage like never before. Because some of the things that you've been carrying for the rest of the year fall off. And that's where you see the ample time and go, wait, God, what do you want me to do? You could be anywhere else today, but you chose to be here, and I honor you for that. And that's the point. Let us be a people that continue to show up. And here's why. You can't afford not to be here when the Lord does something. Because it might just be for you. But also, it might be for somebody else, which I'm going to get to in a second. Your presence here might actually affect the life of somebody else. Because we're going to have unsaved people on this stage this year. I'm excited for that. You're going to what? Absolutely. What better place to bring an unsaved person than front and center in front of a whole, about a thousand people that love God? That's genius to me. Praise God for our leadership for thinking that. I'm like, yes, thank you, Lord. That's, that's good leadership. Let's do it. If they're willing to have the courage to stand up here, then let's bring the Holy Ghost on. Come on. Number two, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. Now listen, what we're planning to do, just so I can set this up, what comes in this summer goes out this summer. Let me me say that again. What comes in this summer goes out this summer. I don't even know how we're going to do it all. I'm kind of freaked out, to be honest with you. And and the fact that our board is cool with this, again, I'm not even sure what... what, (laughs) We're stepping out in faith. I'll just say it that much, much, because what comes in goes out. We cannot do this if eight people get the message today. If eight of you are like, oh, I get it. I can't give the Lord what's caused me. Some. And the other, the other like 988 of you are just like, what? I d- it has to be a family affair. It has to be something that we lock arms with and say, we're doing this together. We're marching forward together. And so in your tithing and your offering, please be faithful. And, and, and if I could offer you something, just a little bit of advice here, why don't you just come prepared? 
Because I think sometimes we just don't know what to do. Either we don't have enough to give because we didn't plan ahead of time, or we feel pressured in some weird, super spiritual way that's actually not the Holy Ghost to give beyond our means. Can I, can I just tell you, when the Lord is the center and you're at peace with him, he'll speak to you. He will. He's really good at communication. We're the ones that stink at it. And so here's a tip. When you come, just set aside a figure. I, maybe for the hoppers, it's going to be $25 a week, $100 a month. Yeah, maybe that means I can't buy as much honey barbecue sauce for my ribs on the grill this summer. Just be, am I the only person that eats ribs here? Come on. Maybe, maybe it means I can't buy all of the sugar for my sweet tea that I want to. I, I got some feedback. But what I do is I come prepared. I walk into my home, my spiritual home, knowing whoever shows up on this stage, we're ready to bless. It's like, quit talking. Just give me, give me the bucket so I can put something in here to bless what you're doing and see people impacted by it. And, and here's what I want to do. Just take your hand out right now, the hand out that you got when you walked in the door. I, 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 our, our creative arts department did an incredible job with this summer series and the design, and I, I am so pumped by it. But if you flip it to the front... That is a little girl who today is homeless. And I want you to just look in her eyes for a minute. And I am not trying to manipulate you outside of anything other than what I believe is the Father's heart. Can I just ask you a question? Is your giving worth her? Because she is somebody that could be affected this summer by your giving. And you have to ask yourself, is it worth her? When I look in her eyes, is it worth her life? Because it's very easy to be vague and just throw numbers around and say it's going to this ministry. Or that. But when we start to put people behind it, then it gets personal. That's why those faces are in the lobby. That's why there are faces on the website, pictures that you see, and on your handouts every week in different face. Why? Because it's people that we're giving to. And when David saw his people, he said, Lord, I can't give to you on behalf of them, something that cost me nothing because he was walking in a paradigm that he understood he was not a hireling, he was a shepherd. And shepherds don't abandon sheep. They lay their lives down for them. Third thing that you can do, wear this shirt. This one right here, not this one, this is mine. It's kind of sweaty, don't, don't wear this shirt. Right. But these shirts are out in the lobby right now put together by repurpose. I love this. You are a world changer. Every Sunday, we're asking the church to wear their shirts. A thousand people to wear their you are a world changer shirts. Why? You might say, Christopher, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can handle that stylistically. Listen, my style be like nothing. My style would be like whatever my wife picked out for me because if it was up to me, I would wear the same shirt every day until it was so repulsive I passed out from the smell. All right, I have no style. So, so one works for me. You might need like eight I don't, or 18 if it smashes your shoes. I don't know, okay? But the idea is, can you imagine a thousand people showing up with their You Are a World Changer shirts on every Sunday and every special guest that walks in is like, whoa, do you know what we do? We attack and assault and defeat the lie that the church is ugly and a mess. Simply by showing up in a garment, and, and here's the best part. They're starting to look at us, right? And, and, and we're just sitting there smiling. And we got, you are a world changer. When I read that, what happens? It becomes first person. I am a world changer. Everywhere you go, you're a walking billboard to declare to somebody, you're a world changer. You're a world changer. You were born to be amazing. This is your time to rock. This is your destiny. This is who God made you to be. You're a world changer. That's what it does. And so, listen, if you can't afford 10 bucks, they said they'll stamp your shirt for five bucks. And all of that goes right back into these ministries that we're serving this summer. It's a cool deal. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, connect with that. And the fourth thing, and this is my favorite of all of the morning. When you walked in today, you were handed one tag by the wonderful, beautiful ushers who you need to hug on your way out, people. Come on. Hold that tag up for me, just like this, so I know you got one. All right? Here it is. This week, your mission, whether you choose to accept it, and you better, is by this point, next Sunday, you will have tagged an act of kindness. You will have branded something. And, and the reason for this and why I get so excited about it is because I think a lot of times we do really wonderful things. I think if you're in this church for any length of time, you've already done something really beautiful and wonderful. The problem is how often do we forget things that happen for us or to us? 
Really, our memories are very short. And I think that's why journaling is so important as well. But think about this for a minute. Every time that you do something for the next, for the next 12 weeks, we want you to associate it with a brand. We want there to be a purpose behind it. So here's how it could work. You have a cup of coffee that you bought special at Starbucks for one of your coworkers. You know who's going through a rough day. You stick that tag on that cup of coffee, you leave it on their desk, and you get out of Dodge before they get back. And they walk over and they just see, hey, someone thought of you. Someone believed that you were made for a purpose. This is your day. Maybe your neighbor, they, they couldn't, their lawnmower broke and, they, and their weeds are growing up. Man, don't just see that and drive by. Do something about it. You go mow their lawn and you stick one of those tags in their mailbox and when they get home from work, they're like, what happened to my, what, I'm valuable, what? Man, maybe it's an envelope and you know that somebody's really struggling, 30 bucks in the envelope, cash, you write on it. Hey, from someone anonymous, we love you, we're praying for you. Be with, be with the peace of God today and know that we're, we're thinking about you. The tag goes in it. You're made for a purpose. You're a world changer. You're born for it. Slip it in their briefcase and walk away. If you're in social media, you'll see the hashtag on there. You are a world changer. Please use that. Take a, take a quick picture on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever you prefer and, and just put that up. Why? Because we're gathering these pictures. We're looking at them. Why? Because think of this, a thousand people in new life doing one act of kindness a week over 12 weeks is 12,000 acts of kindness. Tell me that my community won't be touched or changed if a church mobilizes to that degree. It's just kindness. I'm done. I gave you my best. Why don't we stand together? And if you could, just extend your hand out to at least get close enough to, to hold somebody's hand or just touch their elbow or their, put a hand on their shoulder. We want to pray together. And we need to activate our faith. Ladies and gentlemen, this cannot be an intellectual marathon. This must be a race that we run together, activating our faith in God, putting action to it. So, Father, right now we stand here as the bride of Christ, as a representation of your beautiful creation, saying and pledging our lives to you, saying, Lord, we will not offer you that which costs us nothing. Lord, help us these next 12 weeks to engage like never before, that we would do it as a family. We would do it as one. We would do it moving into this summer, knowing that not only are we called to be world changers, but we're summoning others to rise up to do the same, that we will not tolerate the things as they have been in the past, but we look to advance your kingdom afresh and anew in the society and culture we are called to steward as servants in Jesus' name. And everybody said with a loud voice, God bless you, New Like. Have a great week being world changers.